At the end of your life, what will be your legacy? What will you leave behind for future generations? For the world, join the world messenger, Isabella Lundberg, each week as she brings you a new distinguished guest from the business, sports, or entertainment world to share their success, their struggles, and their lessons. They will share their insights into current hot topics that affect everyone. Isabella facilitates an intimate, vulnerable environment to find the true value of humanity and real leadership. Are you ready for your legacy? The legacy that matters? Hello, hello, my beautiful friends. It's Isabella Lumba here, the World Messenger, and I'm taking you into another journey of epic legacy leader show where we're having our guest joining us from beautiful San Antonio, Texas. Oh my goodness. I don't know where to start with someone who is not only an associate professor and director and in a very specific field, histocompatibility and immunogenetics. Um, Sandra Matter matter expert on genetics, but it's also someone who is speaking and sharing her knowledge information uh, related to that on a podcast that she's uh, sharing with her colleagues and continues to educate as well as living kidney live organ donor as many other things that I cannot wait for her directly to share. Being obviously professor, educator, continuing to uh, to be sitting on the boards and uh, sharing information that impacts uh, so many right now that we're seeing uh, with over 18 years of experience from science and research, and now to really valid, valid, um, not only theories, obviously biocellular, molecular biology, uh, microbiology, immunology, and many other aspects that for so many of us, we have to go back and a little extra reminder what all this means. Without further ado, let me introduce you to uh, today's guest, Kelly Pitchman. Hey, Kelly, how are you? Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me today. It's absolute pleasure. And again, my apologies for, uh, I just, I'm just feeling like looking at your accomplishments and also seeing such a young, smart, um, young woman in front of me. It's just like, how do you, how did you even accomplish all of this in, in such a short period of time? That's the first question I'm sure everybody wants to know. Well, it's got to be my makeup because I'm I'm not that young. I feel that young, but I'm I'm not that young. I'm I'm definitely almost forty four years old, um, and mother of two. Um, and so I think it probably has a lot to do with my family. And my husband is um, a Superman and Super Dad. I have a lot of support um, behind the scenes for sure, uh, trying to help me, uh, you know, address my uh, academic part of my career and also my clinical part of my career. That is fantastic. And obviously, as a mom of two, um, uh, that is also even bigger question. How do you manage to make that happen? Because obviously, career of research and being professor and also being actively involved in such a niche field that requires ongoing learning, right? And research itself. Uh, how do you balance all of that? <laughs> Very precariously. <laughs> Uh, my daughter is 15. And so thank goodness she is super uh, smart and independent. Um, so she, she would probably tell you that she doesn't need me anymore. Anyway. Um, but she's, she's great. And again, my, my husband, Adam is an outstanding human, a very patient, a very patient and kind uh, man. So he's a wonderful father and I'm super lucky for that. And then we have our seven-year-old son, Jackson. Um, so we are a team, a team effort. Uh, so we, we tag in and tag out as needed. Amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Because again, when, what it takes to be successful just in one field, uh, a lot of times also takes in consideration what's happening in our personal life. But where do we start here? Obviously, do you mind sharing how did you become a, such an amazing uh, researcher and uh, interested in, in this particular field of microbiology? histocompatibility, immunolo immunology, but also immunogenetics, because right now more than ever, we hear the words related to genetics that we really want to uh, understand better. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Uh, I think, you know, I grew up in the uh, 90s 
And genetics was a really hot field. It was growing and we were hearing about it uh, with regards to, you know, family studies, figuring out how disorders and diseases that originated in the genes were passed down in families. The career of genetic counseling was really kind of exploding. The human genome project was going on. Um, you know, this was a, a billions of dollars and decades long study. Um, and, it, you know, it was really big in forensics and crime labs were, were kind of exploding. So genetics was really hot when I was in uh, high school and kind of a budding and growing field. So I was very interested in it and ended up getting an undergraduate major in human genetics. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I wasn't really sure if I wanted to go to medical school if I was more interested in research. So I kind of took some time to explore the research route. I got a master's degree in cellular and molecular biology and then decided that I, I liked the research route. So I got my PhD in immunology. I was studying uh, inflammatory diseases of the gut, like Crohn's disease and colitis, and trying to find treatments to assuage those illnesses. And when I finished my doctoral degree, as I was kind of wrapping up, I had the opportunity to join a research group at Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida, that wanted a mucosal immunologist to work with them on characterizing and discovering therapeutics for a condition called graft versus host disease. And this is a condition that you can get following a bone marrow transplant or a stem cell transplant. It's kind of when the graft ends up going after its new home. Uh, and it can be quite deadly and dangerous. And it manifests a lot in the gut often, um, like some of the diseases I had been studying in my graduate work. So that was really my first foray into transplantation. And when I finished up there, um, I had the fortune of having a graduate student whose father ran what we call an organ procurement office. Uh, and these places are responsible um, third party entities that allocate um, and take care of deceased donor organs in the United States. And they're all over the country and there are usually several in each state. And uh, so she said, you know, like your background is, you're just like these ladies down here in Tampa that direct this thing called an HLA lab. Uh, and it's in this in this organ procurement office. You should go meet with them and talk to them. You might you might want to think about doing that. And um, that was Myra Lopez Sapero and Sandra Resto Ruiz um, at uh, LifeLink in Tampa. And they were just these brilliant women partnering to run this very important laboratory in this huge organization. And we got along great and they were very encouraging. So they took my um, resume with them to their annual meeting. They were already part of the American Society of Histocompatibility and Immunogenetics. And I was so very fortunate. Um, I didn't really understand it all at the time, but I was so very fortunate that um, one of the people that grabbed my resume um, was Dr. Annette Tambor, and she directed the HLA laboratory at Northwestern um, University in Chicago, Illinois, and invited me to come there after meeting her. Uh, so I did a fellowship there, and that was my first introduction to solid organ transplantation, got way more in depth into um, human clinical uh, bone marrow transplantation as well, and transfusion support. And then, uh, you know, took my boards and started interviewing for directorships and ended up uh, very fortunate to um, have the directorship of the HLA laboratory here in San Antonio, Texas, uh, with University of Texas Health in San Antonio. Wow. Wow. What a journey. And then you just did not touch on all of that, what you just mentioned, but you also continue to look at what's going on in uh, pathology aspects of it and then working on the laboratory side of the medicine and continue to also look at uh, aspects of transplants. And um, you are also live kidney donor. Do you mind sharing how all of this brought you to that decision and that journey? Yeah, thanks for asking. 
So when I was training at Northwestern and really learning um, to pivot from a basic scientist type of career to a clinical care type of career, or really kind of a hybrid career, you're using science to help um, these care teams treat these patients and find um, compatible transplant pairings for these patients. Uh, I, I learned really quickly uh, that in the HLA laboratory, a large part of what the laboratory um, director uh, does is clinical consultation. And so when a patient that needs a transplant comes up for an offer from a deceased donor or a living donor in the U.S., and that could be for a kidney, for a heart, for lungs, um, for a pancreas, um, one of the first groups of people that gets called to figure out if a donor and a patient are a compatible and safe pair for transplant is the HLA director. And so the HLA director, the clinical consultant, will look at the patient's uh, antibody and genetic profile. They'll look at a very specific part of the genetic profile of the donor and using that information, they'll contact the clinical team and tell them what they think the immunologic risk is to the pair and transplantation. And sometimes that leads to, um, you know, kind of complex recommendations. And sometimes it's really clear that the pair uh, has a lot of or elevated clinical immunologic risk and the pair wouldn't be best for transplant. So it really immediately made me very aware of how many people are on the list in this country. Um, right now, there are over 100,000 people on the wait list um, waiting for any given type of solid organ. And usually at any given time, more than 80% of that need is um, for a kidney. And the list in Illinois is large. The list down here in Texas is large. Our patients make up about 10% of the wait list just down here in Texas alone. So as a fellow, it kind of made me realize like, wow, the need for uh, transplantation is huge in this country. And I was also acutely aware of how long our patients were waiting. Um, the average wait up there could be as long as seven, eight, nine years. Um, the average wait down here um, can be about seven years for uh, you know an average rank kidney patient. Uh, and that's a long time. And so I would start seeing these patients finally come up for their chance. And I would look at the donor and the patient and oftentimes determine that it wasn't the right opportunity for that patient. It wasn't the safe opportunity for that patient. And the patients would come up again and again, and especially for the complex patients, kind of over and over and over again, we were saying, you know, you know this looks pretty risky. I wouldn't necessarily recommend this Just over and over. And it kind of makes you think, huh? Like, I wonder if I would be compatible with that person. And we're we're science geeky. Um, we collect all the genetic information on ourselves um, to train to to do these tests and interpret these tests. So I had my own genetic data available. So that kind of planted a seed in the back of my mind that there's a lot of need, and maybe I would be able to help somebody someday. And then after I moved here to San Antonio, um, and my children were a, a little bit older, um, this would have been around the time that. Uh, my son was probably about four years old, uh, and my daughter was probably about 11 or 12 years old. Um, the pandemic hit, and mm -hmm. we also had a lot of social injustice and inequity uh, hitting our country. Mm -hmm. And it took what was also a very difficult process for my patients, our patients here, and everywhere across the country, and just threw these extra hurdles in the way, as if as if it couldn't already be complicated enough. And it actually made me pretty personally upset. And that that was it for me. I was approaching forty, and I knew that as a forty year old, um, if I was medically suitable to be a donor, I could have a lot of reach in an age range of a patient that I could help. And I 
knew that it, it's a good age to to donate. Um, my my organs, if I'm med medically suitable to be a donor, are in great shape and they could be of good use. And I had a pretty good idea that I would probably be a medical a medically suitable donor. I didn't personally know anybody that needed a transplant or need an emergent transplant. Um, but I wanted to be a more uh, boots on the ground part of the solution. Um, I, my my career is definitely dedicated to getting our patients transplanted. Uh, I felt dedicated from the heart to get a patient or more if I could transplanted. So I went to my team and just kind of quietly got worked up. They were able to protect my privacy as much as possible in that process. And I just kind of went through the workup with a very specific goal. Um, there is also a lot of disparity on the wait list for certain communities uh, in South Central Texas. A large majority of our list um, and our patients here at UT San Antonio are Hispanic. Mm -hmm. And they experience a lot of disparity on the national wait list. They are not transplanted off the wait list in the uh, amount that they come onto the wait list. Um, and that can be true for other communities as well. Um, it's definitely documented in Black communities. Um, mm -hmm. So, but my population of patients is largely Hispanic. So I wanted my kidney um, to stay in the community. A lot of people do some of the national sharing programs, which is fantastic. Um, but I wanted my kidney here in San Antonio, and I wanted it, if possible, to go to a Hispanic patient and a Hispanic parent at that. Um, I don't know if any of your listeners have felt this way, but it's a very hard to be um, a full-time working individual, um, even a healthy one, and keep up with children. It's hard to be a parent. I absolutely could not imagine trying to be the parent that I want to be on dialysis um, because I, I've never been on dialysis, but watching what our patients go through, life on dialysis is not life. Um, so I wanted to take somebody um, that was in that situation and allow them um, the ability to be the parent that they want to be, the parent that I get to be um, because I have so much privilege in my life and with my health. And everybody deserves that. So that that was really my my goal in donating. And so um, after I got medically approved, we started looking for chains, um, kidney paired donation chains. Since I was a non-directed donor, I didn't have anybody specified to donate to. Uh, I started looking for people who had living donors, but that weren't directly compatible. And I found a couple of those pairs and the timing was right for everybody and the compatibility was right. Um, so we did a three-way kidney paired donation um, with me as the initiating donor in July of 2021. Wow, that is amazing. What a story. And I love what you said, uh, because that's so close subject expertise that you deal with every day and statistics and also knowing how it is uh, or lack of, obviously, um, opportunities to uh, donate. And when we're also waiting on the list or we're expecting to get from deceased donors and then looking for that comfortability. Uh, um, obviously it's not part of solution and one of our biggest goals as we're talking in this episode of legacy leaders show is to really emphasize what can we do uh, to make a difference and i just want to say first of all kudos mm -hmm. you for um, your leadership and walking the talk and also uh, making yourself available and changing someone's life uh, for better. Did you, on the end, uh, knew who you donated to or is still being anonymous uh, from your end? Yeah, I, I was a little worried about that part, to be honest, because I'm a, a behind the scenes member of the care team, but I'm definitely a member of the care team. Um, we in HLA laboratories all over the country um, contact the patient um, and the patient samples and data um, from before they're listed to the time through when they're listed, when they get their offer, and forever after once they get their transplant. We track them for life um, to help the clinical team keep up with their graft health. So I was very concerned um, about the person who received my kidney. 
feeling comfortable that their privacy was being protected, um, even though a member of their care team was uh, was donating to them. Um, so our legal team um, drafted some paperwork so that everybody was aware that a member of the care team and, of course, living donation um, in kidney care donation does have to be anonymous. Um, so they didn't know who I was, and I really didn't know any more about them other than their genetic and relevant immunologic data and very basic stats, their age um, and their health status. Um, so I, I did not know um, my recipient um, more than that, um, and and my recipient didn't know anything at all about me. Um, but everybody was in agreement, um, and we moved forward. And I was very fortunate um, to get to meet my recipient about a year later, and it that has been the greatest joy. I know not everybody gets to meet their recipients and sometimes not everybody in these situations wants to meet and that's okay. Um, I kind of told them during the workup that I just kind of wanted to do this and I would be happy um, to, to meet the individual who got my kidney if they wanted that, but if they didn't want that, that was fine too. But it was very fortunate to get to meet um, Joel is his name. And um, Joel's a huge blessing in my life. Uh, he's he's a wonderful guy. He's a father of two. He um, was on dialysis for five years, which is pretty amazing. That's a long time to be on dialysis. Uh, and he um, had to have an amputation because of his diabetes that led to his need uh, for a kidney transplant. He's also um, partially blind in each eye because of that. So he went through so much. Um, and despite all of that, he's one of the sweetest and most positive people I've ever met. Um, daily affirmations are all, Joel would handle this well. Do what Joel does. <laughs> Joel is my grace barometer. <laughs> such a beautiful story and uh, such a heartfelt story for everybody watching and listening, not only to uh, learn more, but also to consider uh, to do a similar uh, act of kindness, which I think it's optimal. Uh, ultimate act of kindness uh, when you craft this timeless legacy because of ripple effect for giving Joel um, a chance to prolong his life and give a better quality of life for his children and everybody else that he's serving in community. Uh, with that in mind, I know you were mentioning earlier in conversation how we also have a lot of myths around this, right? So do you mind sharing a little bit what, how long it took for you to recover? What was the process? So for anybody considering or, or wanting to make a difference that they can kind of understand that better, but also uh, that big misconception about being ideal much. Do you mind giving, uh, shed some light on that as well? I'd love to. Thanks so much for asking. So I'll say before I talk about um, my donation, um, the physical part of my donation, the medical part of my donation and the healing associated with it, I do want to preface this by saying that it is really true that everybody's experience is individual. Um, my um, workup and my recovery were downright boring. It, it couldn't have gone better. Um, and, and it's not, that's not true for everybody. So I don't want to sugarcoat that, um, or, or make it seem like it's, it's always the case. Um, but, but, uh, I, I should start there, um, at my center, and this is done differently everywhere. Um, we try to make the process as easy for living donors as possible by having something called a one day workup. Um, so if possible, um, the donors come to the transplant center and they're seen by as many members of the multidisciplinary team as possible. So for both the patients and the donors, it's not just one doctor, it's not just one surgeon, you have a whole medical team with different specialties surrounding you and protecting your interests and looking out for you during this process the whole time. That's true for both patients and donors. Um, so as a donor, um, when you go to be worked up, um, 
it it does take some time. For me, it took a full business day. I did have to take that day away from work. And at some centers, maybe it's done differently and maybe it's um you you'd need more than one day um, or you'd need a few hours, you know, over a few days period to get this done. So it would require, it does require you to miss some some work, which is not easy for everybody to do. Um, so it takes some planning and some scheduling, and the medical team will help you with that as much as they can. Um, so you're seen by, um, for me, donating a kidney, I was seen by a nephrologist. Uh, I certainly had a lot of blood drawn for lab tests. I had to do a 24-hour urine collection where you take this very humbling jug home with you and you 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 know go to the bathroom in it for 24 hours and then you take it back and you hand it in. Um, that's not, you know, like an enjoyable process, um, but it's not bad either. It's just a humbling. And uh, you have lots of scans. You have um, an MRI um, with a contrast and a visualization um, injected into your body so that they can do um, pretty nice 3D renderings of what your organs look like. So they know what your anatomy is. Um, that's an important thing for the surgeons to understand. And that is not a bad procedure, but it's not a comfortable procedure. Um, it makes your whole body feel really, really warm. And you have to stand really, really still. Um, and you have to get in one of those small tube instruments. Um, so if you're claustrophobic, um, it might be a little bit uh, tense. Um, but it's not a long test. You have to have x-rays. You even meet with um, a, a sociologist, a psychologist, um, to make sure that you are coming forward for the right reasons and of your own volition. Um, the medical teams have every interest in making sure that donors are not being coerced or uh, made to feel by anybody like they have to do this. And you're told over and over and over again that if at any point during the process you're uncomfortable or you don't want to proceed forward, even if you're being wheeled back to the OR, it is your right to say, I don't want to do this, and it stops. So um, there's a lot of support and a lot of comfort given to donors in that way. You also meet um, with a, an LDA, a living donor advocate. So there is somebody on the clinical team appointed um, to be an advocate for you and your interests. So they'll talk to you um, and make sure they understand your motivation for donating and what your interests are. Um, so after all of that, all of the results from those meetings go to um, a multidisciplinary discussion where they look at all the data that was collected and they determine if they need more data. Sometimes some of the test results come back with some maybe concerns. They wanna make sure the donors are safe. So you might need to have more data collected or if everything um, looks like they can make a determination at that point, they can say that you're medically suitable um, to be a donor, or they might say that they found some contraindication to you being a donor. Um, so I, I was approved to donate after that. And then we started looking for uh, people that I could donate to. And I think this is important to know that um, that is not always a super fast process, especially if you're non-directed. Um, I think donors have goals. Um, I certainly had goals. I wanted to try, if possible, to donate to a Hispanic parent, and I wanted to try to get as many people transplanted as I could. Um, so the team will help you with that with those goals as much as possible, but finding those people and making sure everybody's compatible and that the timing is right, it doesn't happen overnight. So um, there were even moments that as part of the care team, having gone through this process with many people, um, but not having gone through it myself, that I thought like, wow, I just want to donate a kidney. And it seems like I can't get this kidney away. <laughs> we would come up with um, a kidney pair donation chain and then the timing wouldn't work out or, you know, uh, maybe some other factor wasn't right for another pair and the chain would fall apart and we'd have to start all over again. So we worked for probably the better part of, you know, seven, eight months um, to make the chain that I eventually donated in happen. And 
Um, part of that process that I'm directly involved in professionally is determining the immunologic risk between a patient and a donor. A word that's thrown out very much to talk about when a patient is put in a compatible pair with a donor is that they're matched. And I personally hate that word. Clinically, when we're using that word in the context of transplantation, all we mean is that we have we have put you into a compatible pair. It means that we don't see any contraindication to transplant for this person to donate an organ to this person. But when we use the word match, that word can mean a lot of things. So sometimes I think people misinterpret that the word match means that they have the same blood type or they have the same tissue types, that their genetics are in all or part um, the same. And maybe the most dangerous thing that's usually not true that we could impart in that misunderstanding is that it's not possible for anything to go wrong post-transplant. The organ can't possibly be rejected because you're a quote unquote perfect match. So I do think that part is important to really explain. Um, and in solid organ transplantation, um, you don't have to be the same blood type um, to be a donor and a recipient patient. So if you're a patient um, who's out there and has been told that they might need a transplant at some point in time, or you're already on your transplant search journey and you're looking for a living donor, look for any donor. Don't worry about their blood type. Don't worry about their blood type. We can do something called ABO incompatible transplants. And we've been able to do them very successfully since the late 80s and early 90s. And if we're optimizing a pairing and we want your blood type to match because of, you know, other factors, other symptoms, other issues you have that make you um, a higher risk patient in transplant, and we do want to match your blood type, we can put you into what I went into, into a kidney paired donation system, where even if the blood type is incompatible in a way that we wouldn't want to transplant, we can find you another pair that has the same issue and just swap the donors out um, mm -hmm. so that the compatibility that we want is there. Um, now, the part that I work in, and this gets a little complicated, is called HLA. That stands for human leukocyte antigen. And this is just as important and a much more complex part of determining the compatibility between a patient and a donor. HLA molecules are basically part of everybody's immune system and they're on every nucleated cell in your body. Basically, that's almost every single type of cell in your body except red blood cells. So you can imagine that those things then are not just all over you and the patient, they're also all over the donor's organ that we're gonna put in that patient. And that system is the most genetically complex and variable system in the human body. So we have determined over many years what about 14 different types of HLA molecules might impact whether or not a graft is accepted and retained or rejected. So we type patients that are awaiting transplantation for those HLA markers, up to 14 of them, and the same in donors. And there is a great shortage of donors in this country, both deceased and those willing to be living donors. That is a huge um, part of the Drive for Five Network's mission is to help kind of combat that critical organ shortage. And it's the, the goal of many other advocacy groups. It's a personal goal of mine as well, which is why I donated. Um, and so I think to combat that, um, people need to understand that we're looking at these very complex arrays of genetic markers. And because there's such a donor shortage, there's no way for most people 
we're going to truly be able to find them what we would call an HLA identical match. That a true HLA identical match would mean that you have the exact same 14 genetic markers that somebody else has. And your best chance of really finding that is 25% of siblings are that. But outside of that, it would be really, really rare. So most people that get a solid organ transplantation are not a quote unquote identical match. The vast majority are not. And we deal with those mismatches by giving patients immunosuppression so that their immune systems won't see the difference between the patient and the donor and go after it. We use the immunosuppression to, to calm down the immune system and try to, for lack of a better term, have the patient's body be tolerant to the presence of that foreign thing in it. Um, so I, I used a lot of terms there. So I hope I hope I didn't um, confuse the situation anymore. But I just want to make it clear that the word match has a lot of meanings. And very often, I think it doesn't mean what people think it does. Most people are not a tissue or even often a blood type match. And that's okay. That's not always a direct contraindication to transplant. The whole team, including people in the clinical labs like myself, are looking out for the complexity of the genetics uh, of, and the immune reactivities of the patients in relation to these donors and trying to find what I think more accurately is called compatible pairs, transplant compatible pairs. Um, so after that's determined, you go to transplant. Uh, for me, the healing was very easy. I think um, having had two children, I found giving birth to two children to be much more challenging and uncomfortable than donating a kidney. Um, within four days of the kidney donation surgery, I didn't need any pain medication. Within a week of the donation surgery, I could walk four miles by myself. I'm an avid weightlifter. I was not allowed to lift weights to protect those incisions and let them heal properly for a couple of months. I, I waited that time and took my time and was able to get back to weightlifting, um, you know, a few months after the surgery with no problem. Uh, and I think the experience of a lot of donors, maybe even most donors, is very similar to mine. But there are certainly people who have experienced complications post-living donation. Uh, but the vast majority of cases go very well with no adverse events. And there are lots of publications out there um, showing that living donation is no significant risk to the life or longevity or lifestyle of the donor. Wow. I'm so glad, first of all, that you explained this. And it's so fascinating to see how histocompatibility and immunogenetics involved through science, through research, and obviously practical application that now are making things easier from both re recipients and also organ donor giver. Um, but one thing I wanted to ask you, obviously, you've seen a lot that happen. What is something that you're super excited that is going on right now in immuno? genetics that uh, as a new innovative solutions that are being offered that are changing dramatically the field? Yeah, this is a fantastic question. So I think immunology is a comparatively young science. Um, and so histocompatibility and immunogenetics is an even younger science within um, that grouping of, of immunology and genetics. It's, so it's a very young clinical science. And because it's young and because we have a lot of bright minds in our field, um, there are folks out there that are just innovating new technologies that we can apply for the benefit of our patients at such a rapid rate that it's almost hard um, to keep up with. Um, the literature is growing so fast that it's definitely almost hard to keep up with. Um, I'll give you an example. When we characterize the genetics um, of the patients and the donors for transplantation, there are lots of different tests that we can do to accomplish that. And 
the the way that uh, really has evolved um, that is very interesting and perhaps broadly applicable within the last decade has been something called next generation sequencing. So uh, to break this down in a more simple way that a lot of people might be able to um, to feel like they've had some connection with. Uh, remember how I was talking about early when I was getting interested in science, um, the Human Genome Project was going on, and that project took billions of dollars and decades worth of work to, to sequence one human. So these new sequencing techniques that we can do take a day, and they don't cost billions of dollars. We're doing them right here in my laboratory now for every single um, solid organ transplant uh, patient and donor that comes through our center. And when we validated that test, which we just validated uh, in September of 2023, we finalized it and started using it. The whole year that we were validating that test, we were hearing about this new type of sequencing technology, this third generation type of sequencing technology that was on the horizon. And so we knew the second we got this test validated, it would probably almost be time for us to start validating this third generation test. And actually, that's exactly what we're, we're proposing to our hospital to do that this summer. That's called nanopore-based sequencing uh, and it um, speeds up the process even more um, to a matter of hours uh, compared to a full day. So that's just one example of how the technology in this field is just expanding at a, a rapid, rapid rate. I think the other thing that's going to impact this field, I think we'll see a huge, we're already seeing big uh, explosions of it, but I think it'll be even more so in the next, you know, two to three years. And it's not just hitting our field, it's hitting every field, is the increased use of artificial intelligence. Um, know. You know, I think anything that you can, we want to safely and accurately automate to reduce human error. And the reason that we haven't done that in all fields in medicine is because medical data is uniquely complex and patient specific. And uh, immunology and genetics, it couldn't be more true. These fields are at the crux of personalized, individualized medicine. Um, but now with these new um, technologies, we're figuring out ways to try to model disease states and model outcomes ahead of time to try to predict ahead of time more accurately how our patients might come through a procedure. And there are lots of folks doing that in transplantation and applying those new models uh, and mathematical equations and intelligence features in computational biology um, to transplantation. And I think you're gonna see that that's really, really exciting in the coming years. Um, and you know, being a young science and this compatibility process we're still working on optimizing that. Certainly we have not yet discovered every single gene that's important in these outcomes in transplantation. So we're still working to discover what all of the key factors are in transplant outcomes and how to best determine the compatibility between patients and donors. So that Thank you for listening to Legacy Leader Show. If you enjoyed the content and had a positive experience, then please leave us a positive rating. In addition, leave us positive review whenever you are listening on whatever platform there might be. Make sure your friends and family also know about the benefit and value that we provide and what we have to offer. Cheers.